It was a most remarkable day in Jerusalem, um, loud with the glad hosannas uh, that the crowds cried out. Um, Clothes and palm branches were laid as a carpet as the man Jesus uh, rode down the Mount of Olives on a colt through what would have been the east gate of Jerusalem. But within the city walls that day, um, a question was being asked. No doubt it was from rooftop to roadside from the marketplace and temple. A question was arising that day. Um, And little did the multitudes know who were asking the question that it would be the question uh, that would be asked throughout all the nations of the world across every language barrier, tribes, tongues, nations, as kingdoms would rise and fall and the centuries would pass by, even until this very day. The question, verse 10 of Matthew 21, who is this? Who is this? I wonder how the people there would have asked that question. Because they were people just like you and me. Um, maybe there would have been children there at the side of the road in excitement asking, who is this? Maybe two businessmen who'd known each other for a long time, curiously asking, who is this? Perhaps a mother and daughter, um, perplexed by what was quite a bizarre scene, would have said, who is this? And maybe a Pharisee, a cold-hearted Pharisee, quietly astounded, would have been asking quietly in his heart, who is this? It's the question, the question that none of us can ever escape. One to which each of us must give and reach uh, an answer, find a conclusion. The late C.S. Lewis could narrow down the answers to three possibilities. That either Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Um, A week ago, I received a letter from the Whitcliffe Bible translators. Um, It tells of a boy called Naeem. He grew up in part of the world where it was 99% Muslim. Um, And he writes, while I was a teenager, I kept asking myself, who is this? Isa bin Maryam, Jesus, son of Mary. My teachers wouldn't answer. They just told me he was a prophet and not to ask too many questions. I wanted to find a Bible to read, but this was forbidden in Islam. So whoever you are this evening, whether watching online or here, perhaps you've come with mum and dad, um, maybe something to do in lockdown, something different. Um, Maybe you're curious, indifferent to the question, does it really matter? Perhaps you're a believer and you're struggling with doubts. You've been a believer for years and you get these dark doubts sometimes coming over you. But I put it to you tonight, let's ask this question, who is this is the most important question I can ask and you can ask and get the right answer for eternity, for life and eternity. First thing we can say, this is a real man, a real man. Jesus Christ was a real historical figure. Uh, The events that we read here really did happen. Um, The gospel accounts were probably written about 20 to 60 years after the life of Christ by eyewitnesses. It's interesting, the emperor at the time, Tiberius, when Jesus was born, almost everything we know about him was written 80 years later. So the gospel accounts were written soon after the life of Christ. Historical figure. The Bible is true. And the places we read of here... And a number mentioned here, Jerusalem, Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, are all real places. And we're told in verse 11 that the multitudes recognized him as Jesus of Nazareth, of Galilee. 
And Nazareth, it was an actual town, still exists today in the region of Galilee. It's now the largest city in the northern district of Israel. You can visit there. You probably can't at the moment today. And this is where Jesus Christ grew up 2,000 years ago, um, learning carpentry as his trade. It's a historical figure, real places. He was a real human, uh, fully human, fully man, having a human nature like you and I. He was born of Mary in Bethlehem, like you and me. He had a family tree, which is recorded in the Bible. Um, we're told he's the son of David in verse 9. And Joseph, the husband of Mary, had descendants that went, went back to King David. Um, he had a family tree. Luke chapter 2 tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ, he grew in wisdom and stature. Like every other male here, he grew from a boy to a man. There was growth. In the New Testament, we're told that the Lord Jesus Christ was hungry. He ate and drank, became tired, thirsty, slept, he walked, he talked. He lived in flesh. He came in flesh on this very earth that we live in. As a doctor, it tells me many things. Um, without being too medical, he would have had an esophagus and a stomach, a functioning left ventricle, a pituitary gland. We'd have had a blood group, a blood count, a fluctuating blood sugar level. Here he balances on a cult. So the part of the brain, the cerebellum, would have been there. We can't emphasize this enough. This is a real man. Um, he also had feelings. Um, some people feel more than others, don't they? If we play some sad music, some in the room will cry. Some don't cry if their mother dies. It's just the way we are. We've got different degrees of expressing feelings. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he was often moved with compassion, wasn't he? He wept at Lazarus's grave. He felt, felt deeply. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ was a full man, uh, a real man, fully human, body, and so a real man. Second thing we can say about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is this? We say, no ordinary man. He was no ordinary man. What can we say from our passage? Well, no ordinary man is all-knowing, has perfect knowledge, and can tell you exactly what is going to happen. In verses 2 and 3 of our passage, we read of Jesus Christ sending his two disciples um, to a village to find a donkey tied, a colt. Um, and he says, if somebody says something to you, say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. In Luke 19, there's a phrase there, of the same uh, event. It says uh, that they found it just as he had said to them, just as he had said to them. Exactly. I cannot do that, and neither can you. Um, do you remember when he met the woman by the well, the woman of Samaria? He knew all about her, that she had no husband. She had five husbands. The man she was living with wasn't her husband. Perfect knowledge. He knew all things, and he knows our hearts and desires through and through. No ordinary man finds himself being the centre of the writings that were written hundreds of years before. Uh, we read in verse 5, uh, the prophet Zechariah, which I read at the beginning of the service, uh, given the exact details how the Lord Jesus Christ would enter Jerusalem that day. He wasn't vague, he didn't just say a donkey, but a young donkey, a colt, he will ride upon it. Um, and it didn't dawn on the disciples until later when Jesus Christ was exalted um, that this was the prophecy being fulfilled. And this wasn't the only one. Um, from the Old Testament, thought that Christ fulfilled anywhere between two and 300 or more prophecies written hundreds of years before his life. No ordinary man, perfect knowledge, fulfilling prophecy. 
No ordinary man attracts the crowds for the reasons that Jesus Christ did. Let me ask you a question. What was the real reason they gathered here and cried hosannas out to him? I didn't realize this until I read all four Gospels. In John chapter 12, it wasn't just random uh, that they laid their garments down, cut palm leaves. In John chapter 12, verses 17 and 18, we're told quite clearly, Jesus, he hadn't long raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, and Lazarus was going around telling everybody about the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. He'd been raised from the dead. So the chief priest wanted to kill Lazarus. So it's for that reason, people were hearing the gospel. They were hearing about Jesus Christ, his saving, his resurrecting power, that were told that the people came to welcome him into Jerusalem, to shout the hosannas. Um, they were recognizing him as no ordinary man. This was a challenge to me as I prepared. I thought, as a believer, will anyone be in heaven praising God because of my witness or your witness? Think of Lazarus. He couldn't keep quiet, could he? Couldn't keep quiet. No ordinary man attracts the crowds for this reason. No ordinary man can heal the sick, make the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, the dead to live. No ordinary man can turn water into wine, feed the 5,000 uh, with five loaves and two fish, calm the rage and sea. When I read earlier, we read about Jesus Christ the next day speaking to the fig tree and it withered. And perhaps more remarkably, no ordinary man has the authority to forgive sins. What a claim. So we stand and we say, no ordinary man can transform lives as Jesus Christ did. Um, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, and throughout the centuries, millions, billions of lives changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard of a man, he was, um, I think, an open-air preacher. And he was preaching in the afternoon, and somebody came up who was an atheist. Um, and he said, I'll invite you back here tonight for an open debate. And the preacher said, fine, do, I'm, I'll do that happily. He said, on one condition, he said, you bring with, with you 100 people whose lives have been changed, completely transformed by atheism. He said, I'll bring you a thousand, make it 2000. Changed by the grace and the real power of Jesus Christ. We're standing here tonight, I'm standing here tonight, speaking about a man that lived 2000 years ago, over 2000 miles away. Um, no ordinary man has that impact. Um, Delan touched on it this morning. Um, the Bible is a book that's the most well-printed, translated into the most languages in the world than any other book. There'll be more books written about it than any other book. There's more books written about Jesus Christ than any other man. Um, there's no songs in the world that have been written about anybody else more than Jesus Christ. No ordinary man. Who has the most followers on Instagram? Sorry if you don't know what Instagram is. It's a photo uh, social media app. I don't think there's anyone here tonight. It's Ronaldo apparently. He's got 272 million followers. He's in his 30s, I think. So in 20 years, I wonder how many he'll have then when he's less well known or 40 years, it's like when your grandparents mention a sportsman, you say, who's that? Jesus of Nazareth, which was a small village, back then it was about 400 people, a bit like St. Nicholas or Bonvilston. Um, he, 2,000 years later, says in the world, there are 2.54 billion people who would say they were Christian. 
So it would be 620 million would be um, those who profess Jesus Christ as their saviour and their Lord. And he lived in a time long before social media, before reporters, before Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, you name it. But yet today, he has more followers than anyone else in the world. And he wasn't following the, the textbooks. Who did he surround himself with? A hated tax collector. Fishermen with no formal education. The outcasts of society. He had no possessions, no established home, no formal authority. Even the donkey he rode on here was borrowed. He was born in a borrowed manger. Yet today, millions, if not billions, of followers. He was no ordinary man. And 2,000 years later, um, here we are, and we write the date perhaps every day if you're in school or work. We've all got a date of birth, even atheists, determined by this man who lived in obscurity for the first 30 years, a carpenter's son from the Middle East. He was no ordinary man. He determined time itself. Um, Jesus Christ, that man who rode through Jerusalem that day, no ordinary man. And one interesting point, which will lead me to the third and final point. Why is it when people get upset, does his name come out? You hear it. You would have thought after the last year, it might be Boris Johnson or Mark Drakeford. I put it to you because the Bible says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And we're doing exactly that, just comes. No ordinary man, we're actually acknowledging that therefore he is God, God. And that's my third point, a real man, no ordinary man, the God man, the God man. There's one conclusion here that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was, is fully God. Just days after this account, um, from Matthew chapter 21, Jesus would stand, wouldn't he, before the elders, the chief priests and the scribes um, who would ask him in Luke 22, verse 70, are you then the son of God? And he said to them, you rightly say that I am. Peter, who was an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 16, verse 16, said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. No other man in the entire history of the world who has claimed to be God has not gone on but to have it disproved. Nobody else. But Jesus Christ never has. Never has. There's a man on one of the wars the other day saying he is God. He's not God. His life isn't perfect. And that can easily be shown, as with my life and the rest of us. But of Jesus Christ, no fault was found in him. Even his worst enemies were out to get him, could not find an accusation against him. His life was without spot or blemish, any wrong, was sinless, perfect. From beginning to end, he kept perfectly the law of God so it leads to the question then, doesn't it? So why did God enter this world fashioned as a man? Why, born of a virgin, did the sinless Son of God come? We read in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 17, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved, that the world through him might be saved. He came to save, to save. And I look at my own heart and I see I need saving. You might say, Andrew, you, but you're a doctor, you do good to people. What do you need saving from? That's what people think. Well, what God asks of me 
in the Bible is to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with him, to love him fully. And I have not. I have not. I've rebelled against him. I love to go my own way and do proudly what I want. I love myself above all things. I've offended the holy God, my creator, my sustainer. I need saving. We all do from the sin that is within us, from its guilt, its shame, its wages, which is death, eternal separation from God. And Jesus Christ, the God-man, in love came to do that amazing love that God would do this for sinners. It's interesting. He rode and thought through the east gate of Jerusalem on that day known as Palm Sunday, or has become known as that. And it was four days before the Passover feast. Um, the Passover feast was, of course, when the Jews remembered God bringing them out of Egypt, delivering them from slavery in Egypt. Um, and Exodus 12, verse 3, tells us that on that very day, the Paschal lamb, to make sacrifice, would be taken up. And it's thought that it was brought through the east gate of Jerusalem. And it would spare God's people from destruction. That's what it stood for, the blood, the shedding of the blood. On this day, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, came through that gate. Um, he came as a living sacrifice for sin to save his people from destruction that we deserve for our sins. And willingly, amazing, isn't it? Willingly, the Lord Jesus Christ, the living God-man, went to the cross to die for my sins upon the cross, to bear the sins of many, to die as the wages of sin, to satisfy the wrath of the Father against sin in the sinner's place. What amazing love, amazing love, no love like this towards sinners. He went as the priest to offer himself as a sacrifice for God, for, for sin to God. The people here in verse 11, when the question was asked, say, well, they think Jesus Christ is a prophet. They say, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. He was a far greater prophet than they ever realized, the great prophet. He came to show us and tell us the way of salvation. He himself is the way and the truth. Um, and in the Bible, we find the way of salvation. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet. But he's welcomed, of course, here as king, isn't he? Verse 5, your king is coming, lowly and sitting on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. He came as the humble servant king. Um, his whole life was one of humility as a king, wasn't it? And do you remember when he was born? Where is Jesus, who's king of the Jews? He's born in a, a manger. And here he's riding on a, a donkey, not in a chariot. And there on the cross, that sign put up, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Jesus, king of the Jews. Such humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he came to preach the kingdom. The kingdom that is not of this world, that's spiritual, invisible, exists, never ends. And his message was this, the kingdom of God is at hand for all of us now too. We must repent and believe upon Jesus Christ. And he didn't just die and was buried, but on the third day he rose again. He's the, the risen king, the risen Lord. And he's been declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, the resurrection from the dead. So he's a prophet and a priest and a king, an all-sufficient saviour. If somebody's a liar in, or mad in society, we all know it, don't we? We all tend to know it. it word gets around. And it soon gets passed on for generations to come. 
that somebody was a renowned liar or insane. This has never been the case with Jesus Christ. Nobody would have taken him and his message so seriously and dare to pass it on to those they love and care about unless these things were true. And that's how all these accounts are written, which is now the Bible, the New Testament. These trustworthy writers, fellow humans, um, are telling us what they have seen and heard, that they've touched the Lord Jesus Christ, this God-man, that we may believe upon him and have eternal life. It's the word of God. And Jesus Christ, my friend, he's alive today. He died for sinners like you and for me to rescue us from our lostness, our rebellion against the holy God. And he lives. Um, he stands beside me by his spirit, um, closer than a brother, a dearest friend, patient and kind, infinitely wise and loving. And he stands for you tonight and he says, I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Turn and live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. This explains the church. Why you enter perhaps an ordinary looking building, any part of the world, Yet you meet very different men and women. And there's something about them. You can't put your finger on it. There's a love and a joy, a gentleness, a kindness, a goodness. There's a reality. So you see a university professor chatting with one of his best friends who's a bin man. Somebody whose life was ruined by gambling now living a quiet and ordinary life. A young teenager spending time with an elderly disabled person. An ex-alcoholic, a converted homosexual, someone just released from prison who now seeks to follow Jesus. A single mother whose husband left her, but she's got such a peace about her in her life. Mindfulness well-being course, counselling, self-help books, tablets, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. They found the answer to who is this. He is real. He's no ordinary man. It's the God man. And he's their ever-living and present saviour and their king, their eternal hope, their glory. And you ask them, you tap them on the shoulder, and they say, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. They say, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me return to Naeem that boy I mentioned at the beginning, who asked the question of Jesus, who is this in his Muslim country? Well, finally, a Christian missionary moved into his village and Naeem um, had the gospel explained to him the good news of Jesus Christ. And the missionary gave him a Bible um, in his second language, and he hid it in a bag of flour. But God spoke to him, and Naeem could say, as the Bible was explained to me, my thirst for Christ grew. It says in John 14, verse 6, that no one can come to the Father except through him. Once I understood that truth, I accepted Christ. And so I ask you this evening, wherever you're watching or listening from, is Jesus Christ yours? What must we do? It's all been done by Christ. We just believe on him. We cast ourselves upon him. Cannot save ourselves. Only he can save. The people here, didn't they? They threw down their garments before him, their palm branches. And so by faith, we come to him humbly, helplessly. We lay all our sins, 
all our burdens down at the feet of Jesus Christ, who can forgive us of our sins and give us peace with God because of his death on the cross. Can you sing, he took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own, amazing. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, how my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love to me. One day for everyone here, this will no longer be a question, who is this? It will become a statement, who this is. We will all meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And if at death, when all we've known, never known, and none of us have died before, so we think, what will it be like when things that we've seen around us and people we love fade from our eyesight? Well, for the believer, the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I'll come and receive you to myself. We'll know that who is this? This is our Savior and King. But for those who do not belong to him, here he was the humble servant king who came to bring salvation. But on that final day, he'll stand as judge of each one of us. And he will return again. He won't come on a donkey, but he'll come to the sound of a trumpet with angels through the clouds as exalted and reigning Lord and King. And every knee shall bow, every tongue and confess that he is Lord and God. Are you ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ? And when you do, it's a wonderful thing because you have forgiveness of sins, peace with God. We still mess up, we still sin, but Jesus Christ is our righteousness and we trust in him, we're safe and secure in him forever. Amazing. Somebody who was a, a good influence in my life, um, he died last year, 93, um, and he was told last summer he didn't have long left to live. So I spoke to him on the phone a few times and I asked him, I thought, well, I wonder what it's like. I said, are you ready? Are you ready to die? He said, well, that's very bold to ask, he said, but he said, I'm glad you did ask. He said, yes, I am. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And he paused and then he quoted with a humble confidence. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for me. Oh, what an eternal rest to trust in the one who rode into Jerusalem that day, a real man, no ordinary man, the God-man. So the Holy Scriptures leave us all with this one question tonight, and I urge you, my friends, to consider and to respond humbly in faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is this? Amen.